بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم He was not killed he was not crucified before they can get hold of him and kill him and crucify him God protected Jesus and uplifted Jesus to himself He was crucified not crucified neither killed To say he's not crucified doesn't that fail to acknowledge historical documents We all want to seek the truth we all want to be sincere we all want to please the creator right and with all due respect either all of them are wrong or one of them is right all of them cannot be right at the same time In Islam they believe blow yourself up 72 virgins That's what you get, then you get to have sex for eternity. This discussion about arriving at the truth and uh, discussing the truth is at most important for not just for me, for you and for all of us. What we choose is going to be a deciding factor for us where we go in the hereafter. You're a genius. There are three Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. However, it's that third one, Islam, that is perhaps the least understood here in the West, which is why it is my great honor to be speaking to my guest today, Dr. Sabil Ahmed. Doctor, thank you so much for coming on. I truly appreciate your time. It's my pleasure, uh, Paul. Good to be here, driving two and a half mile, two and a half hours. Finally. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I truly appreciate that long drive that you made just for this show. And you know what? I think it's going to be worth it. Doing my research on you, I was blown away. Look, you have videos, multiple videos on the internet with millions of views. You have hundreds of thousands of subscribers just on YouTube, not to mention the other social platforms. You really do remarkable work. You do your job very well. But for people who perhaps don't know who you are, what is your job exactly? I do three things or three areas of focus. The very first one is to motivate and encourage and educate Muslims how to be good humans, good Americans and good Muslims. How to reach out to the neighbors, how to, you know, help humanity. So that's one. Second one would be how to educate our non-Muslim brothers and sisters about the faith of Islam because of the misunderstandings unfortunately. And the third important focus area Paul would be to educate and to integrate those people who of their own choice they have converted to Islam. So that's what makes me busy. And that's kind of what your organization, the Gain Peace Project is all about, doing those three things that you just said. Is that fair to say? Yes, yes. So Gain Peace, we started this about 12 years ago to make sure that there is a platform of people who are passionate about sharing Islam educating people, you know, building bridges, making humanity better. So speaking of organizations, I got to give a quick shout out to the MSA, the Muslim Students Association here at Illinois State University. They are the ones that put this whole thing together. You guys are great. Thank you so much. Okay, now moving Wonderful. on with this. Doctor, we call it, as I said in the introduction, Islam is one of the Abrahamic religions, meaning that it stems from the first prophet, Abraham. In Christianity and Judaism, we can trace our lineage back to Abraham, of course, just as you can, and then to his son, though, Isaac. Where exactly does Islam come from, and how can it say that it is an Abrahamic religion? So the question now is, uh, okay, where does Islam come from, right? Who is the founder? What century? What is the lineage? We say that Islam is the first and the only faith that God has given to the very first human, the first human, obviously, is uh, Adam. So we say when God created Adam, uh, God did not left Adam alone on his own human shortcomings. So God started to guide Adam and Eve, and the main commandment that he gave them is do not worship animals and plants and trees and the creation, but only submit to the one creator. So that submission to the creator in Arabic is Islam. So that's mm -hmm. point one, right? Point number two would be, uh, as humanity is uh, growing, as it is uh, populating around the world after Adam and Eve, God says in chapter 16, verse number 36 of the Quran, that he has from the humans, he raised prophets and messengers and gave them a fundamental commandment, which is invite humanity not to worship the creation, but worship the creator. So we say that every single prophet, every single messenger, they came with the message of Islam. And the last of the three points would be this. As humanity, as they deviated some people in humanity uh, away from monotheism and submission to God and worshiping God, then God appointed many prophets, many messengers to bring them back to the faith of Islam or the faith of monotheism. So in that way, we say all the prophets, 
may that be Abraham and Isaac and Ishmael and Solomon and David and Noah and Jesus and Muhammad peace be upon all of them we say they all came with that same one concept to bring people to Islam to the worship of one god and for that way Muhammad peace be upon him was also appointed as the last and the final prophet to revive the original faith that was given to Jesus and all the prophets i see beautiful answer however in case i missed it you know which i very well might have Isaac the son of Abraham from him comes Judaism and Christianity i haven't seen where islam then comes from he has abraham has other sons of course mm-hmm. i've heard rumblings that it comes from ishmael his other son is that correct so prophet muhammad peace be upon him he was a descendant of ishmael who was the very first son of abraham right so the branch of the arabs it comes from ishmael and the branch which is coming from the side of isaac are the jewish people so we don't say that muhammad peace be upon him was the founder of islam we say he is a reviver of islam the original islam that was given to all the prophets so the lineage of muhammad peace be upon him is coming from ishmael not from isaac if that's what you want to know right right just to be overly technical that's how i operate okay yes i understand that completely then so you're saying muhammad peace be upon him why do you say that why do you have the peace be upon him at the end is it important that you say that or is it just a nice thing to do well three reasons right number one reason god himself says in the quran that he is sending the blessing the peace on prophet muhammad peace be upon him him and his angels so the believers you also do that that's one reason second reason would be prophet muhammad peace be upon him he himself said when you hear my name say peace and blessings in arabic language but english is also fine okay right and the third reason is out of respect and honor and love and the admiration you know like for my parents i don't say their names i say you know mom or dad in my language if suppose if a uh, president uh, Obama comes in here for example right <laughs> i was going to think which president should i say <laughs> okay <laughs> suppose if president obama walks in here you're not going to say you know why hey dude obama man how are you doing right <laughs> you're going to say you know president obama it's an honor for me that you are in my studio respect and honor you would you use the title president before you know the word obama in the same way we love and admire and respect the last prophet that god has appointed for humanity for these reasons we say peace be upon him understood completely in my faith in traditional catholicism and this is probably a minority within catholicism but the more traditional folks whenever we say jesus christ at mass will always do this mm-hmm. just like you say peace be upon him or we even say jesus christ his name wasn't jesus christ it was jesus the christ is what we yeah. would say that all said who exactly is muhammad peace be upon him I'll, i'll go ahead and say that but who was muhammad he came around a few centuries after christ did if i understand correctly around the 600s 500s 600s but you tell us who is the last prophet as you said muhammad prophet muhammad peace be upon him he was born approximately in the year 570 a kind of 600 years after Jesus he was born in the city of Mecca he was just an ordinary uh, child a youth as he was growing up but one thing that was extraordinary about him is that he was taken as the most credible person in all of arabia like nowadays suppose um, if i have to introduce a friend of mine to you i would say you know what this uh, my this is my friend akram he is uh, really good in basketball and he's passionate about uh, table tennis right some of his hobbies and his background that's the way i will introduce him to you in those days people used to introduce prophet muhammad peace be upon him by saying that he is a citizen of arabia he is the most truthful and he is the most honest person amongst us so those were the titles that he, they gave him so until the age of 40 he was just an ordinary person but at the age of 40 and an angelic presence came to him angel gabriel visited him the same angel gabriel from the bible yes who came and spoke to mary yes the okay. same angel gabriel so he came and he brought the first revelations of the quran from god from allah to the prophet peace be upon him right so that's how the revelation started and that's how he knew that he is a prophet of god so the four things that were given through him to humanity the very first thing was Uh, the original monotheism was revived through him the second thing that was given through him is that uh, 
people now realize what is the purpose of life. The Quran says the purpose of life is to worship the Creator. Worshipping in a comprehensive sense, not just praying five times. Worshipping means helping humanity, respect your parents, be a force of goodness in the society. The third thing that he brought from God is the comprehensive guidance for humanity. And the fourth important thing, what is the way for salvation, which we can discuss right as we go. So from the age of 40 in the year 610 until he passed away in the year 632, the revelation of the Quran continued. So he shared the revelation to his people. You know, in Mecca, Paul, people were like idol worshippers. They used to have 360 plus idols. So he spoke about monotheism and against idol worship, against human worship, against the creation worship. Some people accepted that, like very few people, but majority, they rejected his message. So ultimately, the, the people who rejected the message, they came to oppress and torture the Muslims. And they also came after the life of Muhammad, peace be upon him. So then he went to Mec uh, to Medina, about four hours drive from there. I mean, obviously, no cars at that time. Four right? hour drive? Was it a four hour walk or was it? No, if you drive now, it would be four hours. Holy so smokes. So it's about 250 miles. The prophet had some serious legs on him then. So horses and, you know, camels and whatnot, <laughs> yeah, right? How about that. Or it will be like months and months of, you know, walking. <laughs> So that's how he uh, went from Mecca to Medina. And over there, he formed the very first and true Islamic state. He passed away in the year 632, mm -hmm. right? So in a brief, in a nutshell, that's the prophet of Islam. Wow. But he's not only, we say, he didn't come only for the Muslims. He came for all of humanity. Unlike the previous prophets, like Prophet Jesus and Moses and other prophets, they came for certain people in certain time. So we say Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was sent by the same creator to all of humanity. So he was a universal prophet. I see. Yeah. And now, so first of all, you said Jesus, I shouldn't say first of all, we'll come back to this. You said Jesus was a prophet. You said Moses was a prophet. Very interesting. You also said that Jesus didn't necessarily come to change the world and the rest of the future of it. Some would argue that, uh, that, that it wasn't just for that time and place. However, I'd like to know just a little more about, you said when the Prophet Muhammad went to Medina, that he changed kind of that land. He made it more Islamic and he uplifted Jews and women. What exactly did that look like? Because that kind of goes against the narrative that we have here in the West that wherever Islam goes, it's more suppressive. But you're saying Muhammad, peace be upon him. Yeah. uplifted those that area how did he do that yes yeah, some of the listeners it may be surprising to them really how did islam become a force of goodness for women and minorities and especially the jewish people so let me quote you paul a jewish scholar by the name of dr david warrenstein in 2012 may of 2012 he wrote an article in the jewish journal and in there he wrote uh, the, the main title was, so what did the Muslims did for the Jews? And the very first sentence he wrote down is, Islam saved the Jewry. Means Islam saved the Jewish people, right? And he gave like three reasons. The number one reason that he gave, go ahead. Oh, no, I'm so sorry. No, continue. Okay. I, was, uh, so, so I looked the, down on my nose. Yeah, my yeah. so the number one reason that he gave is that uh, the Jewish people, they were at the brink of extinction around the birth of Muhammad, peace be upon him, right? In the 6th century, they were at the, uh, at the brink of extinction because the superpowers of that time, the Persians, the Egyptians, the Romans and others, they were all preying on the Jewish people. So then this uh, David uh, Warrenstein, Dr. David Warrenstein, Jewish professor, he said, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he gave the Jewish uh, groups in Medina autonomy, freedoms, you know, so they were thriving, they had identity, they had the protection from the true Islamic State. So that's reason number one he gave. And that's one way that Jewish people were uplifted, they were preserved. The second reason that he gave is the Spanish Inquisition. Are you familiar with the Spanish Inquisition? Yes, yes, yeah, you are? at least okay. somewhat, yeah. To somewhat, okay. So what happened was, around 1492 and onwards, uh, Ferdinand and Isabella, right, the king and the queen of Spain, they passed many ordinances that kind of suppressed and took away the rights and the freedoms of the Jews and the Muslims in Spain. So many of the Jewish people and the Muslims, they were burned at stake, they were forcefully converted, and some people, they were kicked out of the country. 
So when the Jewish people when they kick when they were kicked out they did not go to the Christian land and some other land they went to the Muslim land the Muslim land of uh, North Africa the Ottoman Empire and yes Palestine so again Muslims and Islam they gave them the freedom and the protection in the land to the Jewish people it's a forgotten history by the way so on my channel i have documented this the top 10 reasons why the jews should thank the muslims all right that's one of my videos so by the way so that's the second reason he gives the third reason that he gives dr david warrenstein how islam came as a force of goodness for the jewish people world war 2 almost every country almost every christian country they were handing over the jewish people to the nazis all the muslim countries they came together and they said we are not going to hand over even a single jewish person to the nazis we are going to write false documents saying that these are our citizens and we cannot hand them over to them in that way the turkish government the muslim turkish government they saved 75000 jewish people who would have been handed over and be killed you know in genocide iran saved 2000 people North Africa thousands of people right Albania and Kosovo and Bosnia and different muslim countries so these are the three ways of the many many ways that islam came as a force of goodness for the jewish people the spanish inquisition in the 1400s they saved tons world war 2 the holocaust they saved tons all the way down to when the prophet went to medina they saved tons That is eye opening for me. I've never heard that to be honest with you and I thought I did some some decent research. Some might say did these nations, did these areas where the Muslims were the dominant faith and dominant people, were they happy to bring the Jews in because it certainly doesn't look like they're getting along right now in Palestine. Okay. Were they necessarily happy to bring them in or is it more that the Jewish people went there? whether the muslim people liked it or not so let's take a look at the spain right so when muslims were ruling spain for 770 years according to the jewish encyclopedia it was the golden age of judaism wow that's a big thing to say so when muslims uh, when they were accepting the jewish people in the ottoman empire in the palestine and uh, also very called in north africa Muslims were following a important commandment of the Quran chapter 5 verse number 32 it says that saving one innocent life is like saving the life of all of humanity and taking one innocent life is like taking the life of all of humanity so god does not say paul the life of a jew a christian a atheist a muslim god is saying that every life is equal every life is precious every blood is sacred every soul is equal so taking that to heart that's what motivated the muslims to protect the safe and to give freedom and autonomy to the jewish people i see that's beautiful and that is something we certainly agree on that all human life is infinitely valuable however i say that though and here again let's go ahead and squash any myths and misconceptions or misunderstandings right now about islam what does islam believe about certain groups of people i should say this forget that What is the punishment if there's any punishment for apostasy? Someone leaving the Muslim faith. What are young Muslim children taught happens if they do leave their faith? Islam has two main sources of guidance. One is the Quran. And I brought a copy of the Quran here. This is a English translation. It's I've been a... wanting to read one for so long. It's tougher than you hold that up a little more to the camera. That's a pretty one, man. Yes. And I have a gift for you. The whole bag is a gift for you. No, all come right? on, you're kidding me. This <laughs> is a favorite episode so far. All right. You have a copy of the Quran, a spiritual goodie, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have some other educational items just for you. You are the best. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. I appreciate that. So in the Quran, there is not a single time when God is saying that if a person changes the faith, give this punishment to the person. So this is the main source of guidance for us, right? And the second source of guidance that we have is the example of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. So, Quran is the book that speaks about the do's and the don'ts and the code of life. Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, he is the one who actually gave the interpretations, the meaning, uh, implementation practices of what the Quran says. The Quran does not say anything about apostasy, kill a person or any punishment, but there is a punishment for apostates in the hereafter. Nothing in this world. 
Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him what he mentioned was in his lifetime there were some people who apostated he did not punish them just because they apostated but there were some people who apostated and now they became uh, enemy combatants and they were killing the muslims and killing other people they were fighting the islamic state they were dismantling the islamic state uh, the punishment was given to them <laughs> just like our country you know we killed by drones you may have seen and heard enemy combatants correct correct so exactly for the same reason if someone is trying to you know dismantle our constitution for example or cause a terrorism extremism or joining the enemy and giving uh, becoming a spy for them there would be punishment so the punishment for apostasy in islam for not just becoming an apostate but fighting against the rules and the regulations of the islamic state so our children today who are raised in islam in an islamic family their parents say if you if the children ask what happens to me if i do leave my faith they won't say we're going to get you or someone's going to get you it's going to be like well god's going to judge you at the end is that correct so the best way to deal with suppose uh, so i have three children right and people have children people have you know youth if a youth says in a muslim family that uh, you know what let me explore other faiths so it's a duty of the parents to educate them first and foremost about who god is what islam is what is the quran why it is good for you why is why it is good for humanity so we should encourage the child uh, not forcing the child encourage the child to remain in islam but if they become adult and now of their own choice uh, despite all the encouragement and the education and the evidence if uh, an 18 year old muslim for example muslim youth says you know what i don't have this connection with islam anymore i don't feel right let me explore other faiths or no faiths for example of course we should give them more evidence or take the person to the scholar a counselor but if, without force by the way because in islam there is no force it says in chapter 2 of the quran i have to give the evidence now right sure, chapter 2 hey. of the quran verse number 256 says la ikraha fid din that means there is no compulsion in faith no one should force anyone when it comes to faith so if a person says you know what despite all the evidence that you're giving me and the counseling and all the sessions i want to leave the faith the parents cannot do anything they can pray to god obviously to bring the child back but they cannot force a person to remain in islam so there is not a punishment of death that is threatened at any point a person if the person is not educated they may say and they may do it you know just like in any faith there may be people who may have a wrong interpretation or the right interpretation right based upon their culture their understanding misunderstanding education lack of education there would be you know there are 2 billion plus muslims around the world not every person may know apostasy and the context in which certain laws came certain freedoms came and uh, apostasy how does god describes it what punishment he gives or does not give anything they may not know that what happened to the apostates in the time of prophet muhammad peace be upon him if they don't know the whole background they may just out of emotions they may try to threaten the person just like any evangelical born again christian may do the same thing or a born again hindu may do the same thing right so out of goodness for the child and out of you know concern and out of uh, love for the child a person a parents may do that but if they do something like that it may not be reflective of islam mm. so it's you could liken it to some of the born again christian fundamentalists in the deep south with limited education living in weird areas doing arcaean old style things within the christian world such as i don't know Salem witch trial stuff like are you a witch let's put you to the test they'll dunk your head in water lift you out see like i don't know weird stuff they'll do these weird practices to see these things and they're really uneducated uh christian practices from hundreds of years ago and these people aren't that educated they're not that smart they're still christians though and they're doing these bad things would you say that and i would say someone who really understands the christian faith the catholic faith Christianity in general the Bible they would never do anything like that however there are people that just don't understand correctly yet still take the name Christian would you say then that maybe someone in Afghanistan for example 
education is scarce. Their emotions run high. There's not that many laws. It might be a little more wild west there. They might be likely to do something brash that you would never do that if anyone who understood, understands the Quran would never do, uh, yet they still take that Islamic name and they say they are Muslim. Is it kind of that way? Just there's different people that practice properly throughout the world Islam and some that just practice it improperly with misunderstandings? Yeah, I mean, you nailed it because I went to Dallas. We had a mosque open house. We invited many of our fellow non-Muslim neighbors and one of the questions I was asked uh, is about, you know, violence and terrorism and, you know, hatred between people. Why do Muslims allow it? How come Muslims are doing it, right? Are you perfect, my dear brother? Are you a sinner? And he said, yes, I commit sin. Then I asked him, would it be fair for me to judge uh, Christianity and the Bible and Jesus based upon your shortcomings? Everyone, you know, they clapped. They knew that where I was going and where he, is, where he was. So then I made a bigger point that we should not judge the faith of Islam or Christianity for that matter for the fallible followers. People may understand the right faith or they have misunderstandings, but the actions of the people should not be, they're not always reflected of what is in the pages of the Quran. Just like me coming over here from Chicago all the way to over here, uh, the speed limit was what? maybe 65, maybe 70, I see many drivers knowing the sign, glaring right in front of them. Many of them, they were going over the speed limit, right? Are we going to blame them or are we going to blame the signs? So exactly the good and bad apples in the followers of any faith or no faith. So we cannot and we should not ever judge. So that's the bigger point. We should not judge the faith and the scripture and theology based upon people who are breaking the laws of that faith. Same thing with Islam. If we see some people in some country, if they are oppressing women, for example, or they're oppressing minorities and forcefully converting someone, doing acts that goes against the Quran and the prophetic uh, example, we should blame them, we should condemn them, but we should never ever blame the faith of Islam for their actions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, don't I hope you understand. To, yeah. Yes, I understand that completely. Yes. And I just want to say then that it seems like ever since September 11th, 2001, in America, that kind of set the tone, albeit incorrect and perhaps very hateful of Islam, because they knew that those pilots on 9-11 were of Islamic faith. But these are exactly the people that you should not judge the entire faith off of because they were improper practitioners of the faith. They misunderstood. They operated on all the wrong principles. Just like I, as a Catholic, would say, don't judge the Catholic faith based on the Spanish Inquisition. There you go, we right? killed St. Joan of Arc like that, and now she's a saint. Um, yeah, I would say don't judge based on those things. However, what you can judge an entire faith on is the book on which the whole thing is founded on. In Christianity, there's a Bible. In Catholicism, there's a Bible and extra biblical information. But mm -hmm. I'll just say Christianity, there's a Bible. There's an Old Testament. And there's a New Testament. We have some pretty rough stuff in the Old Testament, and I'm sure you know that. Some mm -hmm. really rough things. Stone this person just for working on the Sabbath. Let's stone them to death. That's hardcore. However, we have the New Testament. We've been waiting in the Old for the Messiah. Here's what he looks like. We see Jesus. Jesus is the Messiah. Boom. Everything Jesus says is what we should listen to. He says he's the fulfillment of all the old laws. Now, no longer do we have to look at the Mosaic laws that said to stone this person for doing this, stoning people for a lot of reasons. No longer do we have to do that. Here is the new and improved version of Christianity. This is the laws. These are the laws that we are supposed to follow. And it checks out. And when you judge us based on those things, well, we're proud to have you judge us based on those things. However, the Quran, is there a 2.0, a New Testament equivalent in the Quran, or is the whole thing as good as it was then as it is now? Is it just as important today as it was then, and do you live by each and every word in there? Okay, wonderful. That's a good question. So I, I have read the Bible, right? I read Front the Bible back, yeah. many times. Or I read Old Testament, New Testament, the Hindu Vedas, and other scriptures. So when I read uh, the Old Testament near New Testament, I do find about 60 to 70% things common between the Old New Testament and also the Quran. 
However, the slight difference between the Old New Testament and the Quran is, we say that the Quran is uh, the actual verbatim word of God. It's a revelation of God. As if God typed it himself. As if he, he typed it himself. So the Quran that we have, so this is an English translation, right? The actual Quran would be in which language? Uh, would be in Arabic. There we go. All right. <laughs> you know the history, right? Um, so when it came, uh, when it comes to the Quran, some of the viewers, they would be surprised and amazed to find out that when we Muslims say that the Quran has not been changed, we can verify it. There are close to 30 million people in the world who memorized this whole book. So when I ask this question to my Jewish and the Christian friends, how many pages of the Bible have you memorized, right? <laughs> like in the original language, they just smile at me. So this, is, uh, this uh, process of memorization is coming from the time of Muhammad, peace be upon him, up until our time. And it will continue because there is a prophecy in the Quran that chapter 15, verse number 9, it says, Inna nahnu nazzalna zikra wa inna lahu la So the translation is this, that it is God who has revealed this message and he will protect it. So we say every single letter, every single word, every sentence, every chapter, we have what we have in our hands is exactly that was given to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. A bit different compared to the Bible because uh, our Christian scholars, they say, Bible is an inspiration, means God inspired different uh, concepts and passages and people wrote it down in their own you know, language, in their own choice of words, on their own, based on their own circumstances. So, inspiration of the Bible, but revelation of the Quran. Revelation means it's like a hundred percent word by word what God said. So that's what we say the Quran is, and it has been preserved. Uh, there is no 2.0 version of the Quran, and the reason is what we need for our lives, for our salvation, our purpose, our guidance, our solution. Quran has it to its perfection. I see. So for that reason, if something is complete and perfect and last, there is no need to perfect on the perfection. By definition, this is perfect according to Islam. It is timeless. And timeless and universal. So you mean to tell me, Dr. Sabil, that if I looked back at a 1,000-year-old Quran, it will have the same words in Arabic, granted, as this book that you have on this table has right now? Nothing's yes. changed? Yes, nothing has changed. Uh, suppose, yeah, so nothing has changed. Suppose for the sake of argument, we take away all the paper copies of the Quran, right? Take away all the DVDs and online versions and any which way. Even then, people like in this studio, the memorizers of the Quran, they can come together. From their own memory, they can write the whole Quran in Arabic within a day or two days. It will be exactly the same as we have here and the one that was given to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Wow. Yeah. That's really incredible. I yes. did not know that. I'll be honest, you got a leg up on the, the Christian Bible story. That's pretty cool. But all that said, I think it's very special. Here's a little history on the Christian Bible. is It's a collection of books. Of course, there's the Old Testament that the Jews still have today. And they look at the Torah, the first five books, Genesis, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Numbers. I'm forgetting them. Anyway, they had that. And then... There's a whole collection of new books in the New Testament that only got compiled into one book that they called the Bible in 382 AD at the Council of Rome. They said, these are all divinely inspired books that matter enough to be included in what we will call the Bible. Thus, the first canon of the Catholic Church was born. And that was the only Bible there was for 1,516 years, roughly. Well, I guess 1,200 some years since it was 382. And then in 1516... That's when the Protestant Reformation happened. There's an explosion. They took out some books, and now there's 30,000 different religions within Christianity. It's interesting, though, that the Bible isn't one story written by one author. It's a collection of writings from a number of different authors. And when you read it front to back, you notice there's a whole story, which is very strange. There's numbers, tons of authors, divinely inspired, and the books somehow mesh together. With the Quran, is there one author, and is that author Muhammad? So Quran's author is not a man or a prophet or a messenger. The author of the Quran is God himself. But who <laughs> wrote with ink or whatever it was? Sure, sure. 
So as Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, uh, he was given the revelation and he memorized it and he shared it. So that's one way of uh, the Quran being preserved. The second way the Quran was preserved, Paul, is through writing. So he himself, he was not able to read and write. He did not have like a formal education. So he was not able to read anything or write anything. So he had many, many scribes. And these scribes, whenever a revelation came to him or any segment of the revelation, he used to call one or two of his scribes and dictate to them what to write down. So after they, they write down something, they wrote down something, the Prophet used to request them, read it back to me what you wrote down, just to make sure what they wrote down is exactly what he mentioned to them. So in that way, the whole Quran was written down and the whole Quran was memorized. And so we have a check and balance coming between the both the written and uh, the, the oral memory. I see. So that dual check and balance you can never find in for any scripture for any book may that be secular or religious and the benefit of that is this like suppose if i have a copy of the quran here uh, and before the printing press for example you know because of poor eyesight or light may not be good or i may be tired if i'm copying this quran to some other you know manuscript i may make a mistake i may skip a word a sentence i may misspell a word it's a human shortcoming before the printing press, even now, right? If you do the experiment, mm -hmm. the authors, the, the memorizers of the Quran, if they see a copy uh, and they see this copy has one, two letters missing or misspelled, they already memorized it. So they will catch it, identify it, correct it. And this copy will become as pure as this. That never happened to the Bible, Old, New Testament, any book, any scripture, because they have not, never been memorizers of those other scriptures besides the Quran. So this dual form of check and balance is one of the evidences that Quranic prophecy, the Quran would be preserved, is coming true. That's certainly amazing. That's definitely a good look for Islam. The fact that it's preserved, its accuracy, and it's been accurately copied ever since it was created. That's very fascinating. We've spoken ever so slightly on Jesus. Columbus, Christopher Columbus, is about as far as away as today, as us from us today, as Jesus was from Muhammad, peace be upon him. Yeah. Certainly, there has to be a little bit about Jesus in the Quran. Is that correct? A or lot, is, there, is there a lot? A, there lot a lot about Jesus. So just to make it easy for our viewers and also for you, so if someone asks me the question, okay, fine, Sabil, what does Islam say? What does the Quran say about Jesus? To make it uh, understand and to make it easy to remember, I made a simple acronym. And the acronym is Jesus. All right, easy? Yes. All right. So every single letter of the word Jesus now becomes a point about what Islam says about him. So the J stands for he was Jesus was just a messenger. Remember, I will quiz you later. All right. I'll remember this <laughs> okay. for sure. All right. So J stands for Jesus was just a messenger. So the Quran says uh, in chapter 5, verse number 75, that uh, Jesus uh, was just a messenger and many messengers, they came before him or they passed away before him. Mm -hmm. Him and his mother, they both used to eat. All right. And you may be thinking, yes, why is God saying that uh, they both used to eat? Because God is making the point that anyone who eats is dependent on food. And God is never dependent on food. So that means God is saying in an indirect way that Jesus is not God. So J stands for Jesus was just a messenger. The E stands for, right, J-E. The E stands for he was empowered by God to do the miracles. So a quiz question to you, all right? Let's go. And also to them. All right, here is the quiz. Name me one miracle of Jesus which is present in the Quran, not present in the Bible. What would you say, Paul? That is present in the Quran that is not in the Bible? Yeah, a when miracle he, of Jesus. Yes, uh, when he's a baby, he speaks to his mom, Mary, and then he also takes clay and he claps them together and they fly away like birds. All right, man, you passed. <laughs> very good. Hey, you know. All right, very good. Many people, they don't know that. You do. Mm -hmm. I'm not surprised. You did your homework. <laughs> very good. So, so the story goes like this. Uh, so we believe, very similar to the Bible, that Jesus, uh, his mother Mary, she was a virgin. 
Uh, and so when she gave birth to Jesus, uh, she was really surprised, not surprised, she was concerned. If she brings the baby Jesus to her people, they would accuse her of being, you know, immorality, fornication and whatnot. There was no DNA test at, at that time, right? So she was uh, afraid, she was really concerned. So when she brought the baby to the people, uh, they started to accuse and point fingers at her. Why, are, why have you done something immoral like this? She cannot defend herself. She remained quiet. She pointed to baby Jesus. And baby Jesus, he started to speak. He started to speak. This is in chapter 19 of the Quran, verse number 30, all the way to verse number 36. I will just paraphrase it, right? So you may be thinking, okay, come on, tell me, what did he say? Jesus, he said, and the Quran quotes it. He says that I am a servant of God. God made me a prophet. God gave me a scripture. God made me a person to be good to my mother and to pray and to give charity. And then he continues. Uh, so the Quran also mentions other miracles of Jesus. He used to make birds of clay, they used to fly off. It says in chapter 3, verse 49 of the Quran, he used to heal the lepers, the blind, and the sick. Uh, the Quran says that he, uh, he raised the dead. But after every single miracle, Paul, Quran says it is the power of God. Just to make sure that people don't start worshipping Jesus as human, the focus should be to God because the power, he was empowered by God to perform the miracles. How wise isn't it that if Jesus was God, though, that it was still via the power of God that such miracles happen? Because it was, just as if Paul Garcia writes some words, it was by the power of me, if I were Jesus, it would be of God, that God wrote the words, because I'm God and I wrote the words. Because the Quran says, through Jesus, that God was doing the miracles. Oh, it says that explicitly. It says it is through Jesus that God makes this mere man, albeit a prophet, perform these miracles. Yeah, That's for, how it works. Yeah. There is one more passage, chapter 3, verse number 59 to be exact. You know, some people, if they start calling Jesus as God, son of God, because he's doing miracles, God is saying in chapter 3, verse number 59, that the likeness of Jesus in the eyes of God is similar to the likeness of Adam. He made him from dust and say, be commanded, and he was formed. So there's a separation. God is the creator. Jesus is the creation. So in the whole Quran, that is the narrative, right? So Jesus, God is saying that, you know, don't call Jesus as God, son of God, just because he doesn't have a father. Adam did not have a father, but Adam and Jesus and the whole creation, they, they, they were created by God. All God has to say is kun fa yakun, that means be, and by the command of God, Jesus was created. Adam was created. The whole universe was, the whole cosmos was created. So there's E, empowered by God. So okay. since I also studied the Bible, just me give one reference from the Bible, Paul, for our, uh, our listeners. See, even in the Bible, chapter 5, verse number 30 of the Gospel of John, Jesus is saying that I of myself, I cannot do anything. Whatever I hear, I judge. And my judgment is true because I seek not my own will, but the will of God who sent me. So even in the Bible, Jesus is saying that it is by the finger of God. He says in the Gospel of Luke, you know, when he cast out the demons, he says, by the finger of God, I'm casting out the demons. I of myself, I cannot do anything. In John chapter 14, verse number 28, he says, my father is greater than I, right? So there is always someone who is the doer of the miracles, who is superior to power beyond Jesus, even from the Quran and also the Bible. Right, right. Well, oh my gosh, it's very <laughs> fascinating, compelling things you're saying right now. Leave a comment what you think about what doctor is saying right now, especially if you're Christian. Can you defend this? I'll try to defend it a little bit, and it's not a debate, but I just want yeah, to say— Of course, of I course. Think, yeah. It's a I friendly, think, you know, we have to also discuss the differences in a nice, friendly way. We should not shy away. Go for it. Right. Well, so what I would say to that is there is, of course, the Holy Trinity, which is central to— Before the, you go in that direction, should I just finish up the J-E-S-U-S? You know what? For, sure, the, for yes. the sake of completeness. Okay? Absolutely, yes. And Let's I'll just do and it do faster, okay? I will oh, not dwell too much. I'll Take just do, do it we faster. Yeah. 
So the J stands for just a messenger. E stood for quiz question. Okay, Jesus, uh, Jesus, Jesus, just a messenger, just a messenger. Then E is not. You said eat so much. I thought it was maybe eat. It's not eat. It is not eat, man. You're hungry. <laughs> no, I know. It's, ah, give me three seconds. Oh my word! What? I'm sorry. I know what you're saying. You're talking about Mary and the miracles, right? So empowered. Oh, he was empowered right. by God. Man, I don't know about this acronym. <laughs> empowered. Okay, okay. Okay, J E S. So the S stood for <clears throat> the sole mission of Jesus was to invite people to God. Yeah. Sole mission of Jesus. Soul. Okay. Yeah. Just a messenger. <laughs> empower. <clears throat> And soul mm. and soul mission of Jesus was to. And wh why do I say that? Right, the Quran says that <clears throat> in chapter three, verse number fifty-one, the Quran says, the Quran is um, quoting Allah is quoting Jesus, and this is what Jesus says: "Inna Allah Rabbi wa Rabbukum fa'budu haza sirata mustaqim." So Jesus said to his people that verily Allah is my Lord and your Lord. Worship him alone and that is the straight path. So we say that was the main, the sole, the biggest, the greatest mission of Jesus was to connect the creation with the creator. And then you'll be thinking, is there a passage like that in the Bible? Yes, there is. <laughs> All right, let me go to that quickly. Mark chapter 12, verse number 28 a Jewish person came to Jesus and asked him a billion dollar question that of all the commandments of the Old Testament, which one is the first, the greatest of all of them? So a quiz question to you, Paul, right? And you guys can also write it down in the comments if you want. How many commandments are there in the Old Testament to be exact? Oh, you're asking the wrong guy that. And you guys cannot uh, Google this, all right? <laughs> Over a hundred? There's a lot. I know the Jews More. say. Jews say hmm? Okay, there's, there's not thousands, is there? Six, 613 to be exact. Yeah. So the Jewish person, he wants to know of all of the commandments, the first, the greatest of all of them. So Jesus, he replies in chapter 12, verse 29 of the Gospel of Mark. He says that here, O Israel, the Lord, our God, his only one, love him with all your heart, mind, soul and strength. And that is the first commandment. So we as a Muslim, I as a Muslim, I say that Jesus never said that, you know, uh, that God is me or I am that God incarnate. He said, love him means some other entity with all your height, mind, soul and strength that our God is one. He says that is the very first important commandment. Right. So that is S, J, E, S. His sole purpose is to convey monotheism and connect the creation with the creator. Just a messenger, empower, soul mission. Yes. So J-E-S-U. The U stands for he was uplifted by God. He was not killed. He was not crucified. Before that thing happened, before they can get hold of him and kill him and crucify him, God protected Jesus and uplifted Jesus to himself. U stood for? Uplift. Yes. So in the Quran it says in chap chapter 4 verse number 157, it says that they say or they boast that they killed Jesus, uh, Jesus, Messiah, the son of Mary. They killed him not, neither they crucified him. It only made to appear to them, God lifted Jesus up to himself. So we can also come to salvation, you know, one more point, but I'm just giving the acronym. So in Islam, we believe that salvation is not dependent on the blood of someone or someone taking away the sins, it says God uplifted Jesus to himself. Jesus was not killed. He was not crucified. He wasn't crucified? Yes, not crucified, neither killed. As a life person, he was raised up to heaven. He was uplifted to heaven. Now, I believe that he was raised up to heaven as well. And we'll get yes. to the S, the final S. But to say he's not crucified, doesn't that fail to acknowledge some historical documents. We know that Pontius Pilate was a Roman governor under, who was it, Tiberius, Titus? I forget who the main Roman over, you know, the big guy was the president, I'll say. Uh, but we know Pontius Pilate was around during Christ's time. And we, I believe we know that there was a Jesus crucified in that land. Uh, you really don't believe that Jesus was crucified, though. Like, it just didn't happen. The whole, the decision in the court 
none of that happened? At no point was Jesus of Nazareth of Mary nailed to the cross? There is no document written from a contemporary of Jesus that speaks about crucifixion. Josephus was written later on, right? Titus was written, uh, written later on, like many decades. They were not contemporary to Jesus, peace be upon him. You know, just like if suppose if someone says that, you know, 911, yeah, the, that was an internal job or maybe some aliens did it, right? There are theories like that. So suppose if someone writes a book and you receive that book 2,000 years from now, you may be thinking, you know what? Is that what actually happened? Now you are puzzled. So just because somebody has a third and fourth and fifth hand uh, source that says something otherwise, we cannot trust it fully unless and until we have a first hand source from the contemporary of Jesus. And that source, now we can verify saying that it has been authenticated, it has been protected. So to that degree, we don't have the, uh, the chain of uh, credibility and authenticity. Mm -hmm. about crucifixion going back to Jesus mm -hmm. right so well you do you did <laughs> mention actually I think you said Josephus right the uh, writer the pagan writer about a hundred years after Christ he was a philosopher a historian mm -hmm. and he wrote about Christ being crucified and that land being changed forever and he was around less than a century after well I won't say the crucifixion but what I think is the crucifixion and the death of Jesus and he wrote that and he was a very well-respected man. And you would know something about the importance of a man being well-respected in the community since that was the prophet. He was introduced as being the most respectful, they're not respectful, the most knowledgeable, honest guy, you know. So, and that was borderline. That was like Josephus. And Josephus wrote this thing. That'd be a heck of a thing to completely fabricate and get wrong, especially given the fact that not that many people could write at the time, let alone write well, let alone write so well that we've held on to the document for thousands of years. But what you're saying is since he wasn't a direct contemporary of Jesus, he wasn't right there with them, we should take that writing with a grain of salt or just not acknowledge it altogether. Is for that right? Th for three reasons, we need to take it with a grain of salt, all right? Three reasons I'll give you. First and foremost, about Josephus himself, Christian scholars, they say that some of his writings have been interpolated. Some people have added to his writings, all right? Second reason we cannot take his evidence as, you know, the final word is because uh, <clears throat> there are other writings, extra biblical writings that denies crucifixion. You know, at the time of Jesus, I mean, right after him, there have been like multiple gospels in circulation, multiple letters and epistles in, 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 in circulation. And some of them, they spoke against the crucifixion. Some of them, they denied the crucifixion. And the last important point would be crucifixion by itself would not be a necessary pathway for salvation. Even suppose for the sake of argument, if Jesus died, uh, then how would it save me or you? Because we say as Muslims that God can forgive our sins by direct repentance. Nobody uh, can die for us, no animal, no human, right? No creation. Islam says what we do is what we bear, right? So from a logical fairness and a justice point of view, from historical point of view, from Josephus, from Josephus point of view, all of them combined together we say, that his crucifixion or lack of crucifixion is no relevance for our salvation. Hmm. Jeez Louise, <laughs> okay. this, our conversation, it's so fun talking to you. And I really hear your points and you have great points. There's a lot of people in Islam can believe these things with certainty because that makes a lot of sense. Everything you're saying makes a ton of sense. I'm going to come back to why on earth would Jesus have to be crucified for our sins? That doesn't make sense. And you have a great point. It doesn't sound like it makes sense on the face of it. However, before we do that, the S. S, yeah, I was going to say that because they may be thinking, okay, come on, man, just say the <laughs> S. We are, don't leave us in suspense. <laughs> so the S stands for the second coming of Jesus. So we Muslims, we are also waiting for the second coming of Jesus. But when he comes back, he will not come back as a new prophet. He will come back again as a Muslim the way that he left the world as a Muslim. A Muslim is a person who is a follower of Islam. And Islam means obviously submission to God. So we say that he was a Muslim. All the prophets were Muslims. Authentic narrations about 
coming from Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that speaks that where would Jesus come? So it says in those narrations, he will come at the time of Fajr. Fajr means before sunrise, uh, our first prayer of the day is before sunrise. So he would be, de he would be descending, his uh, arms would be resting on the shoulder of two angels. So he would be descending. He would be descending in Damascus, Syria, on the time of Fajr, on the on the minaret of that uh, mosque. It's a white mosque, and then when he comes down, it will be the time for prayer. So people are going to say to him, "Okay, you become our Imam, our leader. Why don't you lead us in prayer?" But he's going to say, "No, appoint your own leader." Uh, so he's going to pray with the Muslims, the Muslim prayer, because we say he was a Muslim. And then him and his army, they will go uh, close to, uh, they will go to Palestine. They will fight the Antichrist and they will defeat the Antichrist. Jesus is going to defeat the Antichrist by the power of God. Then it says that uh, he's going to rule the whole world for 40 days with Islam. Everyone would be a Muslim at that time. He would get married. He will have children. He will do the pilgrimage to Mecca. He would die a natural death. And he would be buried next to the grave of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in Medina. And that is the second coming of Jesus, according to Islam. It's going to be quite the time. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and he'll pray with the Muslims to God, since he is not God, is what you believe. Very interesting. That is extremely fascinating. The Antichrist. I didn't know there was an Antichrist in the Quran. What's that look like? Who is the Antichrist? What's their purpose? What are they trying to do? Is it the devil? Do you believe in a devil? So, or Satan, I should say. Okay, so let's deal with the devil part. Then we'll come to Antichrist, right? So we do believe that there are many forms of creation. You have the animal creation, right? You have the inanimate, you have the plants. Then the three main creations that God created, one would be the angels. Angels are made from light and they don't have a free will, a free choice. They are like the robots of God. They do what God commands them to do. It translates to messenger, I believe. Angel. So, like Angel Gabriel. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Whatever God told him, he came, he gave the revelation and that was his main job. So angels, we believe in them. Then humans we are humans, as a human species, we are given a free choice. And based upon the choices that we make, that's how we are, our hereafter would be. Then there is one more creation, which is called as the jinn, J-I-N-N. -N. Okay? So jinn is a separate creation, we cannot see them. Uh, they also have families, they are good jinns and bad jinns and evil jinns and good jinns. Uh, and they are the ones can whisper to people to do wrong things. Satan was from one of them. Satan, we don't say he was a fallen angel. He was from one of the species of the jinns. Yeah. So, you know, all of these ghost stories that you see, so we don't believe in ghosts. We, we say that uh, once a person dies, they don't come back again. Their soul does not come back again. Um, if we hear any ghost stories, most likely these are the jinns, the invisible beings who can do some things like that. Wow. Yes. I can't believe I've never heard of that. Okay. Yeah. Then the Antichrist. Yeah. So the Antichrist would be a creation of God. And uh, God is going to give him certain limited powers. Uh, and he's going to proclaim himself to be God and he's going to do some miracles, right? To deceive the people. So people start worshiping him instead of God. And he used to cause, he will cause chaos around the world and so many calamities and whatnot. No one is going to tackle him. So God will send Christ. And by the power of God, Christ and his army, they will destroy Antichrist. And what will the Antichrist look like? Is that information laid out? Yes. Uh, so he would be a human or a human form. He would have one eye kind of in the middle. Dead giveaway. <laughs> Dead giveaway, right? <laughs> Unless he wears glasses, secretly has one eye. So, so, but, it doesn't, yeah, <laughs> but it doesn't say 666, unlike uh, the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. All right. So there would be certain features people will recognize that this is the Antichrist. Plus, when he's going to like do all of these nasty things and try to perform miracles and deceive the people, it's a dead giveaway for people. This is that person. But they cannot fight him because he's more powerful. So God would send this positive force 
in the form of Jesus. He would fight, he would bring peace and justice to the world, rule for 40 years, and then the rest of the things I mentioned. I see. 40 years? I thought you said 40 days. No, 40 years. Okay. Yes. So he will come back uh, the way that he left, around the age of 33 or so, he will come back the same age. And he will die around the age of 63-ish, 40 years. I see. It seems that Jesus is certainly fundamental in Islam. The Search Quran mentions point. Paul, you'll be surprised. The Ho- Jesus is one of the most mentioned prophets in the Quran. Hmm. And he performed miracles, and even the prophet Muhammad didn't perform miracles, if I understand correctly. Is that right? So every prophet was given, every messenger was given miracles, just to show to the, their people that, you know, I'm a, not an ordinary person. I'm a messenger of God. God appointed me, and this is my sign. I can do miracles, right? And this is my message. So Jesus was not alone in doing miracles, like Moses and Abraham, Ismail, Isaac, all of them, they perform miracles. Uh, So we don't say this prophet is better because he performed this miracle, this person performed this miracle. We say God is the ultimate authority of the miracles. So for us, all the prophets are equal. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he also performed miracles. But we say the biggest miracle of the prophet is the Quran. But he performed many miracles. We say that he split the moon in half way back time um, he healed the people he multiplied limited food uh, God uh, sent him from Mecca to Jerusalem at the blink of an eye then he went to the seven heavens so through him God performed also many many miracles did not know that yes. it's amazing how much I'm learning in this conversation with you and before we continue on I just gotta say you're a genius when it comes to this when it comes to your theology, your understanding of your faith, and even Christianity, you've memorized Bible verses far better than most theologians will within Christianity, within even Catholicism, certainly much better than I have. It's very, very, very impressive. And your ability to call to mind these verses, specific verses from the Quran, is absolutely incredible. And it just makes it more of an honor to be talking to you. Pleasure to be here. The last S stands for what? Second, Jesus, second coming of second Jesus. Coming. So it's just a messenger. Uh, yeah. Empower, soul mission, uplift, and second coming. You got it. Very good. Got it. <laughs> All right. Wonderful. Okay. Look, let's get down to the nitty gritty, to the down and dirty. Even challenging things, you know, I mean, we need to know, we need to discuss this because this mm. is what I say, Paul. We all want to go to paradise. We all want to have eternal life. We all want to be the best servants of God. We all want to seek the truth. We all want to be sincere. We all want to please the Creator, right? All of us, we are on the same page on that. But then, with all due respect, all the faiths of the world cannot be true at the same time because they contradict. Either all of them are wrong or one of them is right. All of them cannot be right at the same time, logically, rationally. In the same way, all the books of the world or all the so-called scriptures of the world, they all cannot be 100% coming from God. Either all of them are wrong or one of them is right. All of them cannot be 100% from God. So it, it is up to us to find out, to identify and do the research and evaluate and do analysis with the God-given mind, the best gift that God can give to anyone, right? Animals don't have it. Plants and you know, others don't have it. We do. So this discussion about arriving at the truth and uh, discussing the truth is utmost important for not just for me, for you and for all of us. What we choose is going to be a deciding factor for us where we go in the hereafter. Beautifully put. Couldn't have said it any better myself. This is an incredibly important and beautiful conversation being had for the right reasons. To learn, get closer to the truth. That's what we're all striving for. And we're willing to go through the weeds to get there. That's why I have a lot of, as a Catholic, I have a lot of respect for, of course, of course, Catholicism, the first Christian religion. Catholicism, Catholic stands for in Greek, Catholicos, universal, the one church. The one church is what we say. Then Orthodox Judaism, they believe they're consistent. They believe that they are the one true faith. And then even in Islam, if I understand correctly, they believe that they are the one true faith. 
I get lost when it comes to Protestants within Christianity because there's 30,000 plus of them. They say that they might all be pretty much right. And it's like, ah, that doesn't make sense. I at least like the main three. And they're saying, hey, one of us has got to be right. That all said, that was kind of a knock on Protestants. Sorry about that. (laughs) But you mentioned paradise. How about we start there? Let's talk about these few things here, starting with paradise. A lot of Christians believe that if you go down a martyr, you die, you get killed for your faith in some way, or you die protecting your faith or honoring Muhammad, honoring Islam, that you'll go to paradise, the equivalent to heaven, if I understand right, and get 72 virgins to do with what you will. Sexual pleasure is immediately what comes to mind. Explain what that's all about, if you would. Where did you get that 72 virgins from? That's a great question. I've just always heard that. You know, yes. there's very harsh things that I've heard. I'll say it. You know, people have said in Islam, they believe blow yourself up 72 virgins. That's what you get. And then you get to have sex for eternity with 72 virgins. Somehow, maybe they remain virgins despite what you do with them. I don't know, but they're yours. It's, some would say it's misogynistic. Uh, it just, it sounds bad. Is it true? It's not true. Because if a person is doing the wrong things and then expecting to go to heaven, they are misinformed. Suppose if a person, a terrorist, blows himself up and blows somebody else and now expects to get the reward from God, actually punishment would be what will await him or her. Because you cannot get the reward by doing the wrong actions. This is just a no-brainer. right? So let's start from there. So suicide is haram in Islam. Haram means absolutely uh, forbidden. And taking somebody else's life is also forbidden in Islam, haram. That means you're committing two harams and then you're expecting to go to paradise. Uh, Obviously, opposite of paradise may be the place that they would go to, right? So what about a person who is a good person, follows all the commandments, and now they go to paradise? What awaits the person in paradise? Correct? So according to the Islamic paradise, we would be in paradise both in our body and our soul. So paradise is a place that is a place of uh, you know pleasure, it's a place of reward, it's a place of peace and contentment for the soul and for the body. So yes, since we would be in, uh, uh, in our body and in our soul, a different body perhaps. So there would be pleasures of the body in paradise. And there would be pleasures of the soul in paradise. But the greater pleasure would be the pleasure of the soul. Is there sexual pleasure? You said physical body, physical pleasure? Yes. So there would be sexual pleasures in paradise. So in Islam, sex is not taken as something, you know, filthy and negative and, you know, uh, shortcoming of a human. Uh, Actually, it's one of the... You know, desires that God has given to us. It's like eating, right? We eat, but we have to eat the right way, the halal way, the the way that God has permitted to us. If we do it the wrong way, it will become forbidden for us. Same thing for sex and intimacy. Sex is in fact taken as something rewarding. And you'll be thinking, really? How is sex rewarding, right? Uh, Means we will get a reward for it. There is a narration uh, about Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Some of the Muslims of that time came to him. And they wanted to know more about intimacy and sex and whatnot. So the Prophet, he told them that uh, you will get a reward if you perform sex with your wife, right? They would be thinking, why would we get a reward uh, for doing something that we like? So the Prophet said, would you not be, ge- would you not be punished if, you'd, if you had sex with someone outside of marriage? So then the Prophet said, if you have sex the right way, the God-given way with the spouse, God approves it and he will reward you for it. So bottom line is, sex is seen as something which is um, which is reward, it's a blessing from God if you do it the right way. Absolutely. Right? And I completely agree with that. It is an amazing thing. It is a gift from God. God, and he designed you physically to do it. That is how the human race continues to be. It's an incredible thing when it's within the right context because it's so powerful, it's so sacred that when you corrupt it by having it outside of marriage perhaps or other things, it becomes an incredibly powerful tool for evil. 
not good, maybe. So I think we're on the same page with that, actually. Yes, yes. Uh, Minus, I don't think there's sex in heaven, but continue. Right, right. So that is the pleasure of the uh, body. But besides this intimacy and the sex, there are so many other pleasures of the body. We'll have the best homes, the best clothes, the best family, right? The best spouses, uh, best food to eat, the best gardens around us. So what we desire, uh, one passage of the Quran says that even our mind cannot think, our eyes cannot, you know, mind cannot imagine, our eyes has not envisioned the pleasures that God has in store for us. So that will be for the body, right? But for the soul, even a bigger reward would be given to us. So people of paradise, one day God is going to ask them this question, right? Allah is going to ask them the question, are you now satisfied with the rewards that I have given to you? They would say, yes, you know, we thank you so much for giving all the wonderful things. We could not have given, you know, gotten anything better. Then God would say this one day, can I give you something more, something better? They would be surprised. How can something be more better than paradise? <laughs> at that point, look at this, Paul. Then God is going to show himself to the people of paradise. And that will be a spiritual reward that no, you know, no one can even imagine how awesome that overwhelming that feeling would be. So the reward of uh, actually seeing God, being in front of God, witnessing with our own eyes, different eyes maybe at that time, that will be an awesome reward far outpowers any other reward that we think. Mm. So that will be the paradise for a Muslim. Or a person who abides by the commandments of God and worships the Creator. Brilliantly put. However, I gotta ask, just to not to totally dis not acknowledge what you just said. The number seventy-two and virgins. You talked about there will be sexual pleasures. That's fine. That's a great thing. We don't know the details of heaven. Perhaps there's something equivalent to that in what heaven is in my mind or in what my faith believes will there you said there will be sex sexual pleasures bodily pleasures great thing especially once your body's reunited with your soul will there be 72 virgins who will you be having sex with presumably will you no longer be tied to your wife will it just be a free for all i'm painting it horribly please paint it much better and explain more sanitized way right <laughs> <laughs> yes please so by default, it will be our spouses. However, like suppose if a young person, he was killed. He was not married, for example, right? What will he get? So God is going to create spouses for those individuals also. And the person would be able to have intimacy with that person. See, whatever God approves, it is halal, means it's permitted. So they would be our spouses. So they would be special creations uh, in paradise who would be our spouses in those special situations. I see. Yeah, 72, you know. So there are some narrations that may speak about 72, but they are not like strong narrations to build the case. But the bigger picture is this. There would be reward and pleasures in paradise for the body and our soul. But a bigger question than that, Paul, would be this. How do we go to paradise, right? That's a bigger question because all the minute details about, you know, how would the day be in paradise, our spouses, our families, and what pleasures, that is important. But the pathway to paradise is even more important. Mm -hmm. Okay, how do we get there? So, according to Islam, the pathway to paradise is really logical and fair and just. It is what you do is what you bear. If I drive over the speed limit, I am the one to get a warning or a ticket and not you and vice versa. So, it says in the Quran, again I'm quoting you, right? Chapter number 2, oh, this way, <laughs> chapter number 2, verse number 25 to be exact. The Quran says that anyone who has the right belief and doing good deeds, God promises and uh, guarantees th that person and those people eternal paradise. But now your question or their question can be, okay, what does right belief mean? You know, you may say you have the right belief. A person, Hindu may say he has the right belief. According to Islam, the right belief means the person should not associate partners with God. Should say God is only one in one, not one in four and five and three and two and one, uh, any other multiples besides one. True one true God. One true God, the way that 
Moses and Abraham and all of them, they used to worship not Trinity, but only absolute oneness. And mm. we can come to Trinity, okay, mm. <laughs> since I brought this up. Secondly, we should uh, only worship God without any mediator. Because we believe, and you may also agree, that God is all-knowing. He can all, He's all-hearing. That means uh, he's, he's listening to us right now. That's he right. knows what we are thinking also. I agree. So for that reason, we approach God directly. No mediator. Number third thing is, we should not mix the attributes of God with the humans and the creation and vice versa. So this is Islamic monotheism. And all the prophets, they adhere to this Islamic monotheism. So what does the right belief, what does good deed means? Good deeds means a person knowing and practicing the Quran and also following the example of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Now we know that no person is perfect. We always fall short. Every single day we fall short, right? We commit sin, small, big, uh, open, public, conscious, unconscious. The word we sin means to miss the mark, yeah. Miss the mark consciously, unconsciously. We do that. The way for forgiveness in Islam is that we repent to God directly. One of the names of God is that He's all loving, He's all merciful, He's all forgiving. So directly repenting to God and make a commitment not to do it and uh, doing some more good deeds just to replace that sin. So God says in the Quran that He is going to, He's willing to forgive the sins, do not despair the mercy of God. So that is the pathway to paradise in Islam. Not shedding of blood of Jesus or animals or pigeons and goats and camels. Mm. Direct repentance to God and hoping in God's mercy. Ultimately, not how many deeds that we have done, but God's mercy comes into play once we have the right uh, belief and doing good deeds. Mm -hmm. do, good, do good things, do good deeds, ask for forgiveness when you sin, and make up for those sins with good deeds and hope that God judges you accordingly. He will judge you accordingly, but hope he judges you with mercy. That's how you get to paradise. Yes, that's the pathway to paradise. I see. I understand. And you said we get back to the Holy Trinity a little bit, and you talked about forgiveness, right? People are always asking me about this confession in mm -hmm. Catholicism. You don't have to go to someone. Even Catholics believe you don't have to go to someone. You can go straight to God if there's no priest there to hear your confession. If you're out in the desert, you can go to God. Protestants go directly to God. But there's a reason that Catholics, just to put it out there for you know Protestant listeners and everyone else, why do I go to confession? Well, it's because Jesus, after he died, descended into hell on the third day, rose again. In accordance with the scriptures, he came back, walked through a door. All the apostles were hiding. He freaked them out because he walked through the door. And they're like, he's a ghost, he's a ghost, he died. What happened? And that's when Doubting Thomas puts his finger in his side and they say, well, he's real. And then he says, feed me. They give him fish. And then he breathes on them, the Holy Spirit, which is in the Holy Trinity, but he breathes on them. And he says, whosoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. Clear as day. And it's not like he just says it like another one of his gospel preachings. It's right after he comes back from the dead, walks through the door, and he says this to them. Ever since that day, the Christian church, the Catholic church, has been hearing confessions. And those were the first priests, and they were given that authority by God. Jesus, I should say, by Jesus, who I believe is God, gave them that authority to forgive sins. Because he's going back up with his father. And he did a few days later. He ascended into heaven, which is the thing that we both believe. He ascended into heaven. And that is why after he left, no longer did people kill animals. They didn't pray straight to God. If they had the opportunity, they went straight to a priest. And he acted in persona Christi, which means in the place of Christ, to forgive those sins. They don't forgive the sins. It is God who forgives through them. Just like you were speaking, that's how, what you believe. Jesus, that's how he performed miracles. That's how we believe that priests can forgive sins. That's why they forgive sins. It was a thing from Jesus who we believe is God. Just had to explain that. Now, the Holy Trinity. So, just on that point, then we will come to the Trinity part. Sure. See, God is a God of the, all of humanity. The forgiveness of sins has to be a universal pathway or open to all the humans. The pathway should be open to all the humans. So a natural, logical, rational question that comes right away with the explanation that you gave. Jesus came and then he 
about he forgave the sins and the Holy Spirit was blown into the people and whatnot, then the rational question that comes, that people before Jesus, how were their sins forgiven? Okay, if we say that they were forgiven by sacrifice of the animals, what about before that time? And what about those people in China and Australia and Africa and South America, even before Moses and Jesus, all of them, they came? Yeah, the jungle people in Abraham, the righteous pre-Jesus people, what happened to them? So what Islam says is that God is a God of even all of those people. And exactly the same human formula, direct repentance to God and doing the deeds that God has given for a messenger that was appointed to them is the pathway to go to paradise. So Islam's uh, pathway of paradise is open and universal. All people, all time, from the time of Adam till the last human. I agree with that. Yes. I agree. And then you talk about how, for instance, how would the jungle people in the year 5000 BC, are they just doomed? They didn't know Christ. They didn't know God. They didn't know much Mm -hmm. of anything. Are they doomed to hell? What about Moses? Moses, how was he going to get his sins forgiven? Well, he did kill animals and whatnot. Uh, That was what they did. More about that later. But... Here's what we believe. Truly, as Catholics, Christ, we say, descended into hell. That's probably not the case. There's a limited language in the Hebrew language. There's not all that many words. What we believe is he descended into the bosom of Abraham, more specifically. That is where all the righteous people pre-Jesus that couldn't get into heaven, because heaven really wasn't, the gates weren't open, so to say. He went and visited them and said, hey, I'm the Lamb of God who washes away the sins of the world. We're going to heaven. Basically, that's what happens. And he goes to heaven, and they call him the Lamb of God because pre-Jesus in the Old Testament, how would they get their sins forgiven? They would pray to God, but they would also have to do something. They would kill an animal. They would sacrifice a pure animal, a lamb. Well, if you want all the sins of the world forgiven, you can kill a goat and get your sins forgiven, maybe you and your families. But if you want the sins of the world forgiven— and be able to be forgiven in the future, you're going to have to kill the Lamb of God. God made flesh. That's why we call him the Lamb of God, the eternal covenant. After you kill this, you don't have to kill any more animals forever. And it's not like you have to kill this like it's just another animal, but it is the Lamb of God to wash away the sins of the world again, open up the gates of heaven, etc., etc. I just had to kind of explain that a little bit, but then, oh, What about the people that don't know Christ? Well, if you're in the jungle, you never even heard of Christianity, Catholicism, God, anything, you at least have a moral conscience. Before there was Christ, before there was much of anything, there was the Word, the Holy Spirit, the Word that made everything come into reality. How did God create the world? He said, let there be light. That's the Holy Spirit, this animating element that constructs all of reality. The Holy Spirit can also live in your conscience. In fact, that's kind of what we believe. It's not necessarily dogma, but if you don't know God, you still have a moral conscience. All humans do. If you go against your moral conscience, I know this is wrong. I'm going to do it anyway. You are at that point sinning, but you still can't unknowingly sin. So jungle people, if they're going to kill someone innocently, they still know it's wrong. You can trust that. They still know it's wrong. And if they do that, they're sinning, even if they don't know God and God's going to judge accordingly. Just the same, if someone's running around naked and they don't think that's wrong, despite it being nudity, impure, whatever, I would say that it's not a sin because they don't have a moral conscience that's telling them that and no one told them that. So God, again, judges accordingly. That's what I would say to that. And then if I'm a Catholic in the desert, I don't have to go to a priest again to get my sins forgiven. I can go straight to God when the time permits and that's the only option. So, If there's no priest around, you can still be forgiven. If you're not Catholic, if you're not Christian, if you don't know anything, if you're in the desert, Australia, China, whatever, if you go against your moral conscience, that is how you would sin. And that is how you would stay holy if you abided by your moral conscience because that is the thing, the guiding mechanism, the moral compass that we all share, even if we don't know God. I only say all that junk, junk. I only say all that just to explain some of... From your theology, right? From my theology, my understanding, yes. You know, just to make one, just to take one more passage from the Bible that aligns with uh, the Islamic concept of salvation, right? This is in Matthew, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 19, verse number 16. 
17, 18, and 19. So a person comes to Jesus and he asked him again an important question. He says, Oh, good master, what should I do that I should have eternal life? A direct question, how do, what, what, makes, what process I should follow so I can go to paradise? That's what the person is asking. Jesus, first and foremost, he says, Okay, why do you call me good? There is no one good except one who is God. So he's separating himself, right? Number one. Hmm. But even the bigger answer that he gives is this. If you want to have eternal life, if you want to go to paradise, follow the commandments. And the person is asking, okay, what commandments? And Jesus points to the Old Testament, the, the Ten Commandments. And the first commandments has to do with, you should not take any other God besides me. The rest of the commandments, it has to do with the deeds. So both the beliefs and the deeds... They were mm. the answer that uh, Jesus gave to the answer how to go to paradise. So the belief in God is central to salvation. Yeah, believe in God and then doing good deeds. He also mentioned the good deeds. Yeah. So we say that is the forgotten uh, pathway to paradise. Quran revives it. God reintroduced it. Uh, and it does not defy rational and logic. And you know, every court in the world, it agrees with the Islamic system of justice. What you do is what you bear. Mm -hmm. Right, So we say God is forgiving and merciful. God is not a God who always wants blood and, uh, you know, sacrifice of humans or animals or spilling of the bloods to be forgiven. You know, I have three children. If one of my child comes to me uh, and I find out, you know, he has done something wrong, eaten like three cookies instead of one, for example, I'm not going to bring my other innocent child and slap that child for the forgiveness of <laughs> sins of this person, right? Come right. on, I will be the worst dad of the world if I do that. <laughs> or suppose take this other example. Suppose if uh, you are a judge and if uh, some criminals are over here and they say, you know what, okay, fine, we committed the crime, you know, what is the process of our forgiveness? You're not going to say to the guards, you know, oh, guards, go to my home, bring my son, and I'm going to sacrifice my son. And you criminals, if you if you believe uh, that uh, I sacrifice my son for your forgiveness of your sins, then your sins are forgiven. If you say that, right, honestly, that will be the most unjust thing that uh, that can ever happen in the history of humanity. The most just, the loving, the merciful, forgiving way would be if I see my son and he's sincere, I would say, My, you know, Ibrahim, don't do that again. It's not good for you. You know, go and brush your teeth. I will hug him. I will forgive him. That is a loving parent. God is more loving than you and me and all of humanity combined. I hear you. The analogy works when you say it. However, the analogy falls apart precisely when you say you and your son. Thank you, everyone, for watching this episode of The Paul Garcia Show or listening to it. That was Dr. Sabiel Ahmed. This great conversation might just have to be broken up into two parts at first, but I will release the full version eventually as well, very soon. What do you think of that whole conversation? Leave a comment, like this video, subscribe to my page here on YouTube or on Facebook, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, leave a rating, all that good stuff. Doctor, people already know where you're at, but where can they find you if you just like to say that? You can find me at Sabil Ahmed. You can uh, YouTube me or Google me and you can find my social media handles, especially the YouTube channel. And you can also go to the gainpeace.com and uh, I have a free gift back for you. I will give this to you, right? Number one. Number two, if anyone would like to get for your own education, right? To get a free copy of the Quran, they can go to 800-662-ISLAM or they can go to gainpeace.com. Absolutely no strings attached for your own education free copy of the Quran will be sent to them. Thank you.